Well, you know what? Why I closed it? Not for not for business reasons. We were doing okay. I closed it because uh, everybody started taking cocaine and. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I couldn't get rid of it. I couldn't, you know. Um, yeah, and I, I admit I tried it a few times myself, but then I didn't sleep for three or four days, so I said, the hell with it. But they wouldn't stop using it, and uh, I had given them some stock in the company, and so I couldn't fire them. So the only thing I could do, I didn't want to get caught with a company where there's cocaine all over the, you know, so, so, um, so I dissolved it. And while I was dissolving it, uh, Chrysalis bought it. And then Chrysalis sold it to Allegiance, which is a mafia company. And I didn't get any royalties for about 10 years. And Allegiance sold it to Shanaki, and Shanaki sold it to Fantasy. So now I'm doing real well with Fantasy, because they're an honest company. And then me meanwhile, I started a new label Revenant, um, where, where I don't even have one employee <laughs> and no building, and the whole thing exists over the telephone or in the air, and there's no way to keep cocaine <laughs> in the air, or in, you know, and so um, uh, narcotics have been quite a problem, not in my personal life. Uh, for use, but friends and employees getting hooked on it, several, several of whom died, you know. I don't like the damn stuff. Well, what, what, it, what it basically does is, it's, real, it's a really silly, stupid book. Uh, it's this thick, you know, it's really thick, but it says, uh, we need a myth for the 20th century for Aryan man. Um, we don't have one. Then it says it doesn't even matter if the myth is true or not. And it gives some examples of other myths, uh, racial myths and stuff. And it says it doesn't matter if these myths are true or not. We need them to to mobilize the German nation so it can take over the world. <laughs> That's the whole book in a in a summary form. And a lot of this stupid myth thinking comes from Carl Jung who was uh, the of official uh, psychiatrist of the Third Reich. And, uh, in my book, he was a crackpot. But, but I don't say that lightly. I've, I've looked into his, uh, his psych psychology, if, you, if that's what it is. And uh, I'd like to take him on at some future point. <laughs> it's, and make uh, make a lot of fun of him because I don't think he was a scientist. I think he was a crackpot, and he was trying to start a new religion. But in order to get into that, I, uh, that's a long discussion, and I've, I've got to do a lot more research because the young society won't tell you anything about it. They'll just say, "Oh, well, he got a little confused during <laughs> the Second World War, and then he went back to Switzerland." But, uh, and he didn't teach that any, anymore. So he's okay. He's our Carl Jung. Yeah. Uh, he invented a lot of words like Rosson Cronkite. It's uh, racial disease and uh, Rosson this and Rosson that. You know, when he was in Germany. They already had some Rossin words, but he made them even bigger and bigger, more more Rossin words, you know, <laughs> more racial words. I think the whole thing was a form of humor. Uh, I mean, if if you examine the lyrics and and the the guy singing to some woman, you've been making whoopee with the devil six miles from Death Valley. <laughs> come on, come on. That's humor. <laughs> but these young journalists didn't see that. But that's humor. 
I mean, that's the way the uh, the original Negro audience took it as a form of humor. Um, nobody would would make a record attacking Christianity. There are one or two exceptions where Sun House on Preaching the Blues kind of attacks the Baptist Church. But uh, nobody bought his records. <laughs> they were too too frightening, you know. And so, you know, you want to sell records, you don't make records attacking the church. Uh, no, you have to. Even the blues as lyrics generally supports um, it's like the other side if you had a coin and Christianity was on one side the blues is on the other uh, the blues says oh I'm a long ways from home I'm out here sinning it's, it's, uh, the, the guy's problems are frequently uh, attributed to sin specifically and it's it's like it's okay it's the prodigal son story only he hasn't gone back home yet you know the prodigal son parable yeah um and he's sitting out there and he's saying but i can't go home yet i can't go home yet i'm miserable i'm this and i'm that boo hoo and i'm mad too you know and uh it's uh it, it the blues in no way attacks uh religion uh, that's something I think most people don't notice, you know. But you look at the lyrics, and uh, basically you have lyrics that accept the Christian religion or some some form of it uh, of the day, and blues really supports that. The church. <laughs> <laughs> you might not, you might not expect it to, but it does. At, at the time he recorded, he was not considered any uh, anything exceptional among mountain banjo players. Mm -hmm. He was just another very good mountain banjo player. He wasn't considered a a guy up in the sky. I mean, I mean, uh, Creel Marcus there is responsible for making Doc Boggs into a god. Kind of like what Robert, he's like the white Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson in his own society at the time was not doing anything exceptional. Oh, sure, he was hot and he, he was good, but if you take the lyrics, um, like the lyrics about devils and crossroads and sp evil spirits, he got that idea from Lonnie Johnson before him, and in fact occasionally he claimed he was Lonnie Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's uh, not original with him at all. So these white kids get a hold of it, journalists get a hold of these lyrics and make a real big deal out of it, you know. And then even a movie was made called The Crossroads. The, I, the idea being you could go to the crossroads at a certain time of day and sell your soul to the devil, um, and then you'd be a great guitar player, a great musician. Well, uh, the thing is, those people down there are believers, and you'd have to be insane to go out and sell your soul to the devil. Um, so these are these are myths. Um, That's old fa Faust folklore. Right, no, yeah, I don't think it's as profound as fa Faust. Um, I think it's more a form of humor, and that st began mainly with with Lonnie Johnson. Um. Yeah. Uh, no. There's no profundity there, like in Faust. Sorry. <laughs> Record companies realize that uh, there's a market for certain kinds of religious records out here. Um. Now, like I point out, you couldn't do that with Catholics because the record would have to have an imprimatur or something on it. Or the Catholics wouldn't pay any attention to it. Um. Uh, but the Protestants, you can do anything, you know. You can get away with anything be because uh, there's no authority. The authority is your own interpretation. So, uh, so it's kind of pro-Catholic, I admit that. But, but I'm not even a Christian. I just wanted to... Um, 
I just wanted to point out what was going on on these records. I was I was pointing out that the Protestant uh, records made during the period of the gospel records are very exciting music, but that most of the preachers uh, who made them were phony preachers who also made blues records and things. And um, that this type of emotionalism, I wouldn't take it too seriously. Uh, as much as I like it, I wouldn't. I wouldn't take it seriously from a religious point of view. And so that's why after Pan is sitting downstairs in the, and he's tapping his foot and he's really creating the music, which is the devil's music. <laughs> I'm I'm not a Christian, you know. Um, and the, the the only thing I was doing in the pamphlet we're talking about was trying to point out what was actually going on uh, when these recordings were made, and that most most of the people who made them were not in any way any kind of serious Christians, like. Right. Reverend Moses Mason made records as red hot old Mo's, you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> but um, some people do, some people think that that stuff was real serious, and it wasn't. You know, it's just a way to make money. No, okay, there's, there's big symbolic uh, th songs like about the Titanic sinking uh, or the Great Depression. Or Casey Jones, <laughs> the train that you know wrecked. Uh, th there are songs of John Henry getting killed by the steam drill. Um, yeah, there there's some songs which, in a general and kind of mythological way, um, criticize mainstream culture, but o only in terms of big things like the Titanic sinking. Uh, there's there's not. I mean, it'd be boring to have a folk song which gave statistics about how many people had bread to eat and how many didn't, you know. It's just, uh, no, the assumption is that uh, there are people, capitalists, industrialists, who don't give a damn about anybody. And um, we used to believe them, we folk. We used to believe what they said. But we don't anymore, <laughs> and that's the point of the language, uh, according to my thesis. Most of them, the problem is they still um, have the same value system as the rich people. They want to be rich. You give them a chance to be rich, and they'll do it. So uh, with this kind of uh, hypocrisy, you can't be very proud. <laughs> you see what I mean? The, the, if you, if I, if I want to do the same thing the rich man over there does, um, and I'm poor, I can't really criticize him very much, can I? Because I want to do the same thing, yeah. and if I can, I will. You empty him. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's. That's the big problem in American society is somewhere a long time ago, somebody convinced the American people that it's okay to screw your neighbor. That, you know, I it's okay for me to try to use you as a market, even if I am dishonest. Uh, we can all use each other as, as markets. Oh, I hate that. I don't like that. Uh, but that's one of the big uh, assumptions that everybody in the world, and not just in the, in the United States. I don't even know if it started there. It's all over Western society. I don't owe you anything. You know, I have no responsibilities towards other human beings. I'm just here to make a buck. Right. Now, I mean, you do. There, you know, there are. Uh, there are organizations who try to help other people, and you know there are people who are good-hearted and stuff. Um, 
and I don't want to sound moralistic because really I'm one of the same people <laughs> I'm part of the phenomenon we're talking about you know uh, I like to be rich I don't know if I'd screw other people doing it but I'd, li I'd like to be rich so I have the same value system we all do it's inescapable yeah I created a new myth I don't know if it's true or not uh, I think it is true let me see. It's it's fairly long and involved, but um, my it's more of an explanation of. Okay, Marcus has the official uh, society, and then he has the unofficial society, uh, or underground society, right. or folk society, and um, in my theory. Um, which I, I express in completely uh, outre, uh, I mean, I have gods in there called the Great Kunaclaster preaches this stuff. And um, what, um, what I think happened is the folk music records uh, made between 1926 and 1935, 36, represent um, a uh, form of political, mainly political thinking by uh, the American folk, which was that these big promises the government's been making us and the big industrialists and, and all these uh, speeches by George Washington, you know, it's all nonsense. <laughs> Here we are starving to death. Um, we've been led astray and fooled. You know, now what are we going to do about it? Well, uh, since they had bought into the value system, the folk, the same value system as, as the official that is money. It's okay to screw thy neighbor to make money. Uh, they couldn't very well turn into Marxists. <laughs> so, uh, what you get is a kind of uh, cynicism. Like, like I'd say, real American folk music is is generally pretty cynical, and and it reflects a lot of slang words. Um, the most slang words are pretty cynical. Okay, it's a way of speaking, too, mm -hmm. which, by which you and I can recognize each other. Like, if I meet you on the street and you start telling me how great the bank is or the government, I, <laughs> I know, you know you're not on my side. But if I run into you on the street and you use this funny slang which kind of puts all this big official stuff down, uh, I know you're, you're in the same boat I'm in. And I think a lot of that uh, jargon or uh, anti-official or cynical uh, slang was spread through uh, American folk music. Yeah, I mean, you show me a song... You show me a real folk song that, that I, I can find some cynicism in it. <laughs> it's, it's always there. I mean, unless you're talking about ancient child ballads from Britain or, or something like that. And there's probably some in there, too, you know. But um, I think the American people invented a language. It's also, you could look at it this way. Um, it's, a, it's a jargon... You could say American folk music is a form of self-defense. <laughs> it's the art of self-defense. Yeah, because uh, it says what it thinks about the official. And also, you and I can recognize each other by the language. <laughs> so it's like a martial art, like karate or something. <laughs> No, there's a certain, I'm being humorous, but there's a certain amount of truth in that. A lot of people were very confused by that book and, and thought, oh, there's something wrong with me because I can't understand this book, you know. 
So I showed very carefully how uh, Marcus made false implications and all kinds of... And the book does not, in fact, make sense. It doesn't prove its its uh, main thesis, which is the, the, the uh, anthology of American folk music tapes or records, the, what they call the Harry Smith Collection, produced Bob Dylan's basement tapes. No, no, no. No, it doesn't work. This is a crazy idea, and, and that's what Marcus tried to prove in his book. But the way he tries to prove it is by bringing up hundreds and hundreds of illustrations of and non sequiturs, and <laughs> there's no proof doesn't work so I thought I uh, I thought somebody should get after this Marcus guy first of all because he's very well respected and on the basis of, the, of this book he doesn't deserve to be respected um, but I, I don't want to keep punching him forever I mean you know mm -hmm. the time is I'm not criticizing him anymore I'm sure I hope he'll go back and be, write more careful books you know but um, I, uh, yeah, the book made me pretty mad, and uh, there's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstanding in there. Uh, I, I don't go about thinking, will this please an audience, you know, I, I don't compose songs that way. As long as, as long as your music's other directed, it's going to be kind of uh, surface. I just try and play directly from the emotions. And um, so my my music has sort of raw uh, unaffected, I think, quality about it. Or at least that's or deep quality. Okay, that's what I think. I'm just trying to express emotions directly to you, so you feel them. And they're strong emotions, and a lot of them are dark emotions, uh, anger and uh, envy and depression, and then maybe a little bit of ecstasy, but not much. <laughs> well, I'll tend to play stuff that is at first very uh, uh, disturbing, <laughs> and then, you know, it'll... It'll reach a peak and then it'll go back down and I'll end with, like, uh, just last night I ended it with a very peaceful, slow, major key uh, song. So I don't want to leave everybody upset. I want to take I want to take you on a trip, you know, through through the darkest emotional jungle there is. But um, I don't want to leave you there. That wouldn't be nice. <laughs> The good blues singers are not sad. They're mad, angry, you know. Robert Johnson and Charlie Patton, uh, they sound mad to me. <laughs> you know, not, <laughs> Bessie Smith. <laughs> you know, they don't sing the country. I'm talking about country blues singers. Which is a uh, not a real definition by it. I just we just mean emotional um, blues singers, as opposed to Bethy, Bethy Smith, uh, the great queen of the blues. Who her all her things were arranged very carefully. There were probably twenty people involved in each production, and sure she had a nice voice, but uh, it's all contrived. And what what very few people in the world know is uh, I found hundreds of her 78 RPM records and they all say Bessie Smith comedian with orchestra they don't say blues singer with orchestra mm -hmm. comedian yes so I mean to call that crap blues is really uh, not, not right well, it was produced by John Hammond Sr. Uh, and other music writers, and they wrote the lyrics. And sometimes they'd use uh, traditional lyrics that they learned from Bessie. But it was all very carefully arranged, contrived. There's not one wrong note in the 
whole in the whole thing and uh, and a, cu- a couple of them are really nice like St. Louis Blues uh, with, with just it's Louis Armstrong on cornet or trumpet and organ it's very nice that's very nice but when you get a whole band in there some of whom are white people and and the arrangement was made by a group uh, sorry it doesn't turn me on it's not very spontaneous you know as whereas your country blues singer comes in out of the cotton fields and hobos a, a railroad up to Chicago and walks in he probably smells <laughs> But what he does is tremendously exciting and spontaneous. 